Well, greetings and salutations. I am Jacob, and uh, I attended the first annual Midwest Liberty Fest uh, with many of you here. And I wanted to speak to the subject of permaculture then, um, and how it might relate to how we could possibly meet some of our needs for autonomy and choice. But uh, I didn't really feel that enthusiastic about making the requests to be heard in the subject at the time when I could just clearly see that so many were already happily meeting their needs for connection and community and meaning. And uh, so instead I chose to meet those same needs for myself at the time, uh, knowing I could just as easily speak in uh, this kind of forum. Uh, so here we are. And uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank Danny and Katie for all their work in putting together the Midwest Liberty Fest. And uh, to, for all, to all the other persons, uh, I'd like to extend my thanks who those who also no doubt contributed in making that convening just a, a just a wonderful gift for everyone and uh, now through the magic of YouTube I can speak to you on the subject of uh, permaculture possibilities for meeting needs for autonomy here on this video so before uh, I begin what to tell you what maybe permaculture is uh, let me first start by asking uh, some probing questions some uh, deep reflection uh, what is stopping you from being free uh, what is holding you back from living your life in a way that uh, every act, uh, every day, is an act of play, a day of play, a gift of enjoyment to yourself? And of course, I bet uh, a lot of us are going to be uh, tempted to say, it's well, it's the state, it's uh, the government, it's the institutions of domination, is a way I like to, to put it. Um, it's terminology that meets my needs for clarity. And uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> these uh, these uh, institutions of domination, they use a lot of violence and they use a lot of coercion, a lot of extortion and expropriation. And uh, yeah, that's a whole lot of non-needs meeting going on right there. But uh, there are also like indirect effects, ripples of, uh, of violence that kind of deform social institutions, that deform, uh, um, you know, even market uh, phenomena. And so... Permaculture, I think, it really addresses these pieces a little bit better than the, the directly the violence, the coercion, and the expropriation. Um, it deals with these kind of uh, after effects, these ripple effects of violence, and perhaps how to live a more peaceful life, um, you know, less affected by those ripples. So yeah, while the state is a, a serious major obstacle, um, uh, an impediment for the meeting of human needs in an authentic way, and uh, meeting needs of choice, meeting needs for autonomy, uh, meeting uh, needs for space, um, not uh, having to be submit submit to every demand. Um, even if the, the but if even if the, the state uh, or the institutions of domination were to persist at least for a little while, um, how could we live freer now, um, even under these conditions? You know, even if there, we are living in a territory dominated by institutions of domination, uh, what could we do to live a little bit freer? And how would, and to that end, how would you feel uh, personally? How would this affect your feelings of your autonomy needs meeting if you didn't have a mortgage, if you didn't have utility bills, if your grocery expenses were a half to a tenth of what they are now? How free, how much freer would you feel? No mortgage, no rent, no utility bills, you know, very low grocery expenses. You know, would you even still work your current job? And, uh, you know, even if you still worked it a little bit, uh, if you didn't really need a lot of income, uh, you could scale back hours at work and enjoy your life more. And, and we'd be paying a whole lot less income taxes, too. Hmm. That's something to think about, starving that beast. So uh, how might your life be different if every day was like a day at the Midwest Liberty Fest? or it was a small slice of pork fest. And so the idea I would like to share with you is that uh, permaculture offers some possibilities on how we might uh, live our lives um, and uh, a little bit freer, how we might uh, uh, live in safe and comfortable homes without mortgages or rent. Uh, because, well, there's that noise, that pesky extortion of uh, property uh, uh, um, uh, tax, right? Um, I was thinking of... Uh, feudal rent, but, <laughs> uh, you know, in, well, anyway, permaculture, you know, has explained, you know, has developed some possibilities on ways that people could live um, uh, in a house where that they could build themselves. And even for people who've never even built a birdhouse, um, could learn how to build a, a home themselves using, you know, simple building techniques and utilizing many natural materials that are fairly inexpensive, you know, homes that are in many ways superior to conventional houses. 
And permaculture also explores ways in which we might produce our own energy and electricity, how we might heat our homes with just uh, sticks that fall from one acre of wood, wooded lot, how we might design gardens as food production systems that need very little input from us to manage themselves. Uh, you know, there are ways to harvest your own uh, water, ways to manage your own gray water and even night soil. And uh, when you put all of these uh, techniques together into a complete package, uh, suddenly it becomes possible for even groups of persons to live together in uh, a way where they could be fairly autonomous and uh, may provide for themselves many of their physical well-being needs as well as security and uh, needs for uh, community and connection that we might uh, we might get only a sample of during something like the, the Midwest Liberty Fest or uh, Pork Fest. And, uh, and here's a little dream. Here's a thought experiment. The next time someone says to you, well, what about the roads? Yeah, your response could be quite different ten years from now. Maybe your response would be something more like this. Yeah, ten years ago, I got together with six of my friends, and we moved to this piece of land, and, well, we needed some roads, so we built them. And we read this book, you know, A Good Road Lies Easy on the Land, and um, about a half mile worth of road total, and it really wasn't that hard to figure out or uh, really hard to do. Uh, we also built our own houses and our own gray water management system and you know we're really happy now. We, uh, we really don't need the, the services of institutions of domination. In fact even like education services we've just discovered that uh, our children learn more <laughs> um, if they're left to explore what interests them. Um, you know just last week uh, three of the 12 year olds got together and they built and installed a, a solar panel uh, I saw the solar panel on the on the earth bermed cordwood house that they built last year, and uh, they connected the, that to the solar panels to a solar charger, and connected that to a battery bank, and then connected those to an inverter. And now they're using the internet on cell phones and uh, laptops powered by the electrical system of their earth bermed house in the back. And uh, we didn't seem to need the state for any of that. And uh, did I mention on top of that we grow a lot of our own organic food and. Um, we have uh, such low expenses that it really isn't necessary to uh, work a, much of a job, you know, here, unless someone really wants to, which means most of us just spend our, our days doing uh, whatever we are interested in, you know, reading or fishing or relaxing, um, you know, whatever we find most personally fulfilling. And, of course, we, all, we, we do all this in an ecologically regenerative way uh, that heals the land and makes it more productive and fertile than when we started. So, yeah, I, the whole who built the road question seemed maybe uh, more relevant uh, ten years ago, but you know, I think now it has a really easy answer. Uh, if I want to build a road, uh, I can just build it. You know, I've built a, a little bit of road. Um, you know what I'm saying? You know, uh, I'm saying that uh, respecting each person's individual liberty and autonomy while cooperating harmoniously isn't just a possibility. Um, it's what we're doing. You know, it's what we've built. These ideas are not some starry-eyed theory. This isn't utopian. Anarchy is uh, where we live. You know, I know that's a little thought experiment, a little fantasy conversation in my head, but how does that sound? Uh, are, uh, is there, perhaps if I, hopefully I've piqued some interest in some of these possibilities now. So, all right. Um, I'll talk about what permaculture is for a minute. Uh, well, permaculture is a, really an, a, an approach to design that looks at designing systems which are regenerative and which are generally self-sustaining. The, the, the Wikipedia entry defines permaculture as a, uh, a branch of ecological design ecological engineering and environmental design that develops sustainable architecture and self-maintained agricultural systems modeled from natural ecosystems. And uh, yeah, the, the permaculture and the nitty-gritty, permaculture has what it's called, it calls three ethics and uh, 12 design principles. You know, the ethics are care of the earth, care of people, return of surplus, and the design principles are all very nice and wonderful stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, you can probably learn all that uh, <laughs> on your own if, you, if, if permaculture really interests you. And I'll just get into more of the strategies and um, we'll focus on the techniques rather than the theory. Because if you know if you like the techniques, then you'll, you can learn the theory some other time and you'll probably remember it more later then anyway. So I'm going to explore just uh, five techniques uh, with you all here with the intention that if you think you might be interested in any one of these, then with the internet at your fingertips, you can easily find out more yourself. And uh, I'd like to first start talking about uh, earth sheltered housing, which is uh, a much uh, less expensive uh, than conventional housing, uh, much more energy efficient, and uh, 
and much safer in many respects. And then I'll like to then I'll move on to talk about RAS, rocket mass heaters for heating your home with sticks. And then um, I'll mention uh, water harvesting so you don't need uh, to water your gardens. And uh, then you, I'll be talking about using trees to create food forests. Uh, after, that after you establish them, provide food for you and your livestock. And uh, the only input from you is the harvesting. And then I'll get into some... Uh, agorism opportunities, some businesses that you could operate uh, in or off your land to sell in the Agora. And then uh, I'd like to talk about maybe possibly integrating many of these techniques together and uh, creating intentional communities and uh, in which you are kind of living in the same space of land with many of your friends uh, with similar values so that you can live with that uh, little slice of pork fest or the Midwest Liberty Fest just every day. So housing. Uh, housing is probably uh, the possibly the single largest purchase that uh, we make in our lives. Um, uh, about 20% of our household expenditure on average is uh, spent on housing. And yet we are often living in a house that is built uh, using conventional building techniques uh, only because uh, those uh, conventional building techniques are the techniques that have been approved by the institutions of domination uh, building codes, right? And then, of course, uh, even after these houses are built uh, or we buy, you know, want to buy one, we end up going to a bank for a mortgage, uh, a bank who is uh, uh, a business which is kind of controlled and manipulated and possibly complicit, uh, complicitly cooperating with uh, this uh, central bank, this Federal Reserve Bank. And so, you know... Uh, you know, let's look at the etymology of mortgage. What does a mortgage, the etymology of mortgage mean? Well, it turns out it actually means death pledge. The debtor is making a, uh, a death pledge to the bank for a loan that could possibly exceed the debtor's life. So uh, I'm starting to think that, you know, maybe I'd like to start thinking out of the box, you know, maybe for meeting um, many of us with those high needs for uh, of autonomy, uh, we might want to consider alternate choices of housing. Um, that maybe do not require death pledges to uh, indirect subsidiaries of central banks and um, perhaps using des design techniques that are, um, you know, not necessarily uh, <laughs> on the same page with uh, these uh, building codes and things like this. Uh, maybe we can do it a little bit better uh, just using our minds and a little creativity. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely, but I definitely want to live in a house that's safe. That's being a house that's safe is instructionally sound is very, very important to me. I want to be safe in my house, and I do not want my house to contribute to danger and risk to me. So, um, yeah, safe and structurally sound is definitely a requirement. Um, if it was energy efficient, that would be wonderful and wonderful and wonderful. And uh, if it was, uh, you know, warm in the summer and uh, I'm sorry, warm in the winter and cool in the summer, um, and it wasn't that expensive, that would be really cool and. Given these parameters, permaculture gives us a variety of options uh, to include these. Uh, let's see, earth ships, straw bale houses, cob houses, uh, cordwood masonry homes, compressed earth blocked houses, timber frame houses, earth bank houses, rammed earth houses, and earth sheltered houses. And there's probably a few in there that I'm forgetting uh, at the moment. But the one I want to talk about here the most um, and emphasize is the earth sheltered house. And the version of the earth sheltered house that I would like to share is uh, the Ehlers. Pardon me the Ehlers structured uh, earth sheltered house. Uh, the Ehlers structure is, you know, uh, the cheapest and fastest uh, build uh, of which I'm aware. And um, But I'll admit that at the low cost end of an Ehlers structure build, it can be kind of rustic, okay? So, um, but an Ehlers structure, you know, might look anything uh, between a shack uh, or a log cabin on the inside. And uh, from the outside, um, you might not even really recognize what you'd consider a house at all from the outside. Um, from most sides, it, uh, an Ehlers structure might look like it's just part of the hillside, maybe like a little hilly bump on the hill. But uh, on one aspect, you'll see something like a wall of windows. And um, on the more rustic end, it is entirely possible to build a small house of 200 to 400 square feet for just a few hundred dollars. Or scaling up uh, something uh, to at least a thousand square feet, it might only cost two thousand dollars to get the kind of shacky rusticness. Um, two thousand dollars for about a thousand square feet. And uh, but at this low end of cost, it should be possible to build uh, um, a little bit nicer uh, alias structure. You know, for just a little more. Um, 
increasing the aesthetic for, of, uh, from a rustic wooden shack look to maybe a more appealing uh, log cabinish look for $5,000 for 1,000 square feet, or even larger, perhaps less than $10,000 for a house of 2,000 square feet. And, you know, now these estimates uh, for, for the structure alone, independent of all other considerations, such as electrical system, a water supply system, uh, water drainage, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so if we wanted to calculate the cost for a completely livable house of, say, a 1,000 square foot, we might consider maybe $4,000 for the base structure, then 200 for a rocket mass heater, um, and which we'll talk about later, $2,000 for the solar panels and char charger, batteries, inverter, um, for some modest household electricity, maybe $2,000 for some cisterns and for the plumbing, and maybe a few hundred dollars for having uh, two different hot water systems, one for the summer, a solar one, and one in the winter using the, ro you know, taking advantage of the heat from the rocket mass heater. So I'd estimate with a good margin of error to be have a fully functioning uh, house of 1,000 square feet, um, you could probably do that pretty, uh, pretty, pretty well in under $10,000. So, you know, would you really need a mortgage for $10,000, you know? And if you could save up $10,000 and you could, you know, build uh, this Ehlers structure and sell your current house um, and get out from underneath the debt of your mortgage and possibly have something left over to pay off the rest of your debt, how much more free would you be then? How, much, how, how would your needs for autonomy get met? So the Ehlers structure is essentially, uh, it's, an, it's an earth shelter uh, house, which means there has to be some excavation that goes on here. So we're going to start excavating uh, either by shovel or by track hoe heavy equipment. Uh, we're going to excavate some space away from a hillside and we're going to be installing these pier posts uh, that we can um, get from trees. We can just cut the trees uh, down and scrape off the bark and we can use these trees as our pier posts after we trim the branches and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you know, we put these pier posts every four to eight feet depending on the dimensions of the trees we're using. And, uh, and there's an open space called an uphill patio on the uphill side of the house. And the uphill side of the house has a, a bay of windows that looks out onto that patio. And this uphill patio protects the house from the slow movement of soil um, uh, in the hill going down that uh, might someday be pushing against the, our pier posts. Um, and also this uh, uphill patio helps drain water coming down the hillside uh, out past into the sides of the house and it creates a nice place to plant some flowers or shrubs or vegetables that you might want to look out on. And the roof is supported by a pole structure frame, the same kind of pole structure that is commonly used for barns or uh, in uh, traditional Japanese construction. And these, uh, these poles support a roof, uh, a roof which uh, is an earthen roof, which means instead of shingles you'll have grass growing on your roof. Um, you know, there'll be uh, soil on the roof, and uh, then there'll be two layers of polyethylene plastic or EPDM pond liner sandwiched between some soft protective layers such as newspaper, cardboard, or wood duff. And the walls of the structure are made of wood planks or logs or split logs that are protected from moisture by more uh, polyethylene plastic or EPDM pond liner. So I know I'm talking really fast here, but. Uh, you know, you, uh, you know, it's kind of complex, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how it actually is implemented. And, uh, you know, this is the idea. You're having like a log cabin that's kind of partially in the ground. It's bermed up. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of neat. Uh, by, you know, up against this wall is like a dirt, up against the walls, like a dirt fill. And the construction, um, the structure is largely set into the ground, which is why these get the name Earth Sheltered, as the, there's earth or, or dirt sheltering or berming both the walls and the roof. And the, and the benefit of this earth sheltering or earth berming are quite a few. The first is energy efficiency, as uh, those earth sheltered walls and earthen floor and earthen roof constitute a lot of thermal mass, which can absorb the heat of the summer and still be releasing that heat in the winter. And there's a good book on this called uh, uh, Annualized Thermal Inertia by uh, uh, Haight. And uh, yeah, so in the summertime, um, the sun is coming in and it's warming up uh, the thermal mass around your house. And in the winter, uh, that uh, that heat from the summer is kind of being slowly released back inside your house. And in the in the height of summer, you're still you know your house is still bleeding back some of that cool from winter. And so there's some uh, my, some natural naturally natural moderation of temperature in these houses. They're unlikely to get below 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter and uh, merely above 80 degrees in the summer. So our home would be naturally cool in the summer and we'll have some supplemental heat to keep it comfortable in the winter. 
Uh, another um, advantage of insetting the house into the ground is that we are sheltered from high winds. So this is an increased safety factor. And also our houses are uh, less visible, providing another safety feature. Um, you know, if we're less visible, maybe uh, we're less of a target, right? And um, it's also kind of an aesthetic feature, you know, houses that are set into the ground. You can, uh, if you're at ground level, you know, you don't see a whole bunch of houses. You see, um, you know, <laughs> just uh, whatever's around you. Maybe you can see some people's uphill patio and their, their wall of windows, but for the most part, their house is kind of hidden, um, which is kind of a nice, uh, which is kind of a nice feature. And it's also kind of aesthetic. Uh, the pole structure is a common traditional uh, technique in uh, Japan because it is resistant to earthquakes. The poles actually can move up and down with the vibrations of the earth, and therefore the, the structure can move with the seismic vibrations. And uh, there are no solid bounded walls to crack and crumble under the strain of those vibrations. And, uh, you know, there's some other things. You know, you can technically turn these into like, kind of fallout shelters if you're really concerned about that kind of thing. Um, and because everything is uh, earth sheltered, there's really uh, much less surface area for fires to occur on the inside, and uh, very little at all to catch fire on the outside, which greatly reduces vulnerability to fire. And because these uh, structures are ideally situated on a hillside, it just and it just so happens that hillsides are less valuable to builders of conventional housing. That means maybe we can save some money on on buying the, some land uh, to build, upon which to build these. And uh, plus, uh, because these houses are of such low cost to, to build, even if you were to report your house to the ins local institution of domination, um, and I'm not sure why would you, you would, since they might not even be able to see your house. Uh, uh, if it was earth sheltered with aerial photographs to them, it would look like, uh, well, they'd see the uphill patio and they'd see stuff growing in the, like what looks to be like a little hole in the ground. But other than that, uh, they might not even notice. What if you were to alert your local institution of domination that uh, you had a house on your property? Well, the property tax of such a structure would probably be pretty low, uh, if only because the value of such a house is kind of low. So you're paying less property taxes. Hmm, that's another interesting side effect. I would like to recognize that there are two serious downsides, two serious contraindications to the Ehlers structure that I'd like to recognize. Um, the first is it would be really inappropriate to build uh, an earth sheltered um, or earth burned house in a place with floodplains or any place with uh, a very shallow groundwater as if you are uh, if you have water coming in from below the structure uh, you're really not going to be able to keep those poles dry and these poles are uh, holding up your roof and if they rot the roof might come down on top of you and that's a very bad thing uh, the second problem with these it goes along with actually the institution of domination uh, because these houses are so inexpensive um, if you really did want it uh, inspected um, by uh, your local institution of domination inspector um, for instance if you wanted to sell it to someone else who's not uncomfortable ignoring unjust laws then it would be real trouble to get your uh, certificate of occupancy I'm using air quotes even though you can't see my fingers uh, from from your local institution of domination, as any of those uh, inspectors are going to say, well, this house doesn't conform to my inspection checklist, so I'm not qualified to say whether it's safe or not, and you can't live in it until I know it's safe. So you're going to have to hire a structural engineer to put an engineering stamp on the structure. And what he, of course, you know, with licensing and regulatory capture and captured markets being what they are, this engineering stamp it might cost you anywhere from ten to twenty thousand dollars, which could be double or triple the cost of your home. <laughs> so it's kind of almost like the state wants you to get into debt uh, to one of these uh, indirect subsidiary banks. Hmm. So. If you're really interested in these, you can get lots of information on the Ehlers structure from Mike Ehlers book, The $50 and Up Underground House, as well as uh, Ehlers DVD of uh, one of his workshops. And for alternative approaches, uh, in the same vein, Paul Wheaton has some ideas for a few design improvements to the Ehlers ideas, and that can be found at richsoil.com backslash wafati, W-O-F-A-T-I dot J-S-P. And, uh, of course, Rob Roy's book, uh, Earth Sheltered Houses, gives us kind of a same idea-ish, but a really, really different approach. It's going to be more expensive, uh, but it moves the aesthetic of, uh, of a decent-looking log cabin, which is what an Ehlers structure can look like if you do it right, to houses that are, I find, really aesthetically pleasing, um, and would probably even be... Um, you know, would make a, even a noisome and obnoxious code enforcement officer much happier, allowing you perhaps to build a similar structure to an alien structure, at least an earth berm structure, um, 
in a place where maybe you don't have the privacy to build without anyone seeing or knowing about what you're doing on your land. Uh, Rob Roy's designs uh, have a concrete pad for a foundation, which makes the inspectors happy, and uh, a concrete uh, block retaining wall, um, which makes the structure a lot less ecologically sustainable and uh, not quite so earthquake resistant, and of course increases the price to about thirty to forty thousand dollars for say two thousand square feet, and still at least twenty five thousand to thirty thousand um, for one thousand square feet. It just costs a lot of money to get that concrete poured and make sure it's level and screed and everything. Um, but if you do need to make code and the building you want the building inspectors inspectors to be happy, or uh, if one of your beloveds uh, do not want to live in something that looks like a log cabin, uh, but they want to live in something that looks like, and I might quote, quote, a real house, <laughs> then in order to meet all of your needs and their needs, um, Rob Roy's approach uh, is perhaps the direction to look in. So to recap, because uh, I went over that fast, I'll just say it twice fast. <laughs> uh, the alloy structure is a, a pole structure set into an excavation of a hillside with an earthen roof, parallel with the earthen roof parallel to the slope of the hillside, an uphill patio and wooden walls supported by earth sheltering with making the use of uh, some waterproof membrane protecting the wood from contact with moisture in the soil. And these structures are fast to build because pole structures are generally fast to build and the costs are inexpensive if you utilize the trees on the land upon which you are building. And of course the dirt uh, is dirt cheap, comes from your land. And so basically all you need is the plastic, the nails, the rebars, some metal fasteners, tools, and maybe a few other sundry items that I'm not thinking of right now. So the question you, I'd like to ask you now, hey, how might your needs for autonomy, liberty, and freedom get met uh, if you were to build a house for yourself like this? Um, and if you could do so cheaply, that uh, you might not need to indebt yourself to some kind of indirect subsidiary of a central bank. Hmm? You know, are you feeling the, uh, feeling the freedom in the air? Smelling liberty yet? All right, so uh, the next uh, permaculture technique I would like to share is the rocket mass heater. Heating costs uh, consist for about 7% of household expenditure uh, each year, uh, maybe anywhere between uh, $1,500 and $4,000 a year, depending on the climate and the fuel source. And this might not be really, really big money, uh, but consider that very often the corporation that supplies you with energy or natural gas or electricity is uh, often doing so because of a state-granted monopoly privilege. All uh, those wires and pipes are not allowed to compete there. And... Uh, that many of these energy sources might also be further subsidized by the military-industrial complex and military occupations and wars. Mm. And uh, so what if we could free ourselves from that uh, monopoly privilege? What if we could uh, potentially stop supporting industries which are supported by violence to maintain their supply and uh, produce our own energy? Mm. Well, we can move in the, in the direction of energy independence with a rocket mass heater. And yes, you could alternatively just use a wood stove, but if you use a wood stove, then you'll have to use you know five to ten times more wood to heat your house, and you'll have to cut and split and stack your wood for seasoning, um, and plus uh, the wood stove can easily be twice or quadruple the cost of the rocket mass heater. And uh, a masonry stove would be a lot more efficient than a wood stove, very likely uh, just as efficient or maybe even a smidgen more than a rocket mass heater. Uh, but they are a bit more expensive. They do take uh, uh, some special experience and skill in order to build a masonry stove yourself easily. It might cost you 10000 to get one installed. It's kind of a fairly specialized, you know, skill. Um, but they're pretty cool, and if you can afford one, they're awesome, awesome, awesome. However, the rocket mass heater is much less expensive, and you could probably build one yourself for $300 or less. Um, maybe even less if you use recycled parts, maybe $100. All the only part you really needed was a good drum. You know, if you already have uh, if you already have a wood stove, you probably already know about the danger of chimney fires. Uh, chimney fire occurs in wood stoves uh, when deposits of creosote build up on the inside of the chimney pipe due to uh, <laughs> due to products of incomplete combustion until there is either enough heat or enough oxygen and fuel to ignite a fire in the chimney itself. Um, and the chimney is not designed to handle a fire, it's designed to handle hot exhaust gases. So a fire burning in the chimney uh, creates a very tremendous uplift of air. That hot air of the fire in the chimney wants to rise very fast and escape the chimney, which sucks new fresh air into the wood stove, fueling that fire with even more oxygen. 
So if you have a wood stove, you know that if you begin hearing that wood stove uh, making a strange sound, like a rockety wishing sound, like a rocket exhaust noise, like a well, then you know it's time to get the heck out of your house and call the fire department, as your house will probably burn down if that chimney exhaust pipe fails. And as crazy as this sounds, uh, the rocket mass heater is actually designed to create a chimney fire every time you fire it up. But it's going to be a controlled chimney fire. And uh, yeah, so the, the rocket mass heater is actually intentionally designed um, to withstand the temperatures of a chimney fire in its chimney by protecting the chimney, uh, by coating it in, uh, coating the, the chimney pipe in some inflammable surface like clay or a fireproof cement. And what we get from that is a really, really efficient fire uh, it doesn't produce smoke at the end of the chimney exhaust. All the smoke has been burnt. Um, none of the there's no fuel that got to vaporize and is you know leaves the the chimney in the form of smoke. Uh, the only uh, outputs, if you do it right, are carbon dioxide and water vapor. So the the rocket mass heater will uh, surround the chimney with some kind of thermal mass mixture like cob, which is a mixture of clay and sand and chopped straw that can take high temperatures of a rocket mass heater. And as the the heat from passes you know, uh, from the, the chimney, the hot chimney pipe to this, uh, this thermal mass, uh, the heat gets stored in the thermal mass and it's released slowly and gently into the room via usually something like a cob bench or a, a, a couch or a, or a bed made out of cob. And then uh, there's also a barrel, uh, metal barrel, which provides a bit more of a immediate heat so that you can get the room warmed up a little bit quicker. And upon, upon which you can also put your, your Dutch oven or your stock pot uh, and uh, have a meal cooking on your, on your barrel as you heat your home. So to build a rocket mass heater, you'll essentially need a, st a sturdy metal barrel, some chimney pipe, fire brick, fasteners, probably po possibly some special mortar if you want, and, uh, and cob. And again, the cob is that mixture of clay subsoil and sand and chopped straw. And you can mix it with your feet and some water, and you apply it like it was cement or like slip clay if you like you were making a sculpture. And it's kind of pretty fun stuff to to play with and to build because uh, and to build with because you can kind of let your artistic side out a little bit, you know. And you can make your rocket mass heater with your own style, or you can whatever you're doing with Cobb, you can make it your own style and let the artist and you kind of kind of come out. Anyway, you'll arrange your fire brick to make uh, an inner chamber, kind of the, the shape of a, a capital J, and. Uh, uh, the, the, the top of the J will be this the insulated uh, chimney um, with the, insulated with the cob or clay or the fire rated cement and this is where we're going to put put that chimney fire we're going to put it in that insulated chimney and uh, over top of that insulated chimney we're going to put our metal barrel and then so the the chimney fire goes up inside that chimney and then the fire goes right up against the top of that metal barrel and the metal as it that uh, that hot hot air hits the metal barrel it cools because it come, comes in contact with the cool air from you know, the room and then this cool this now slightly cooler air from the the in, that's you know from the chimney fire is now going down on the outside around the outside of the inside still inside of the metal barrel but on the outside of it of the inside of the barrel and uh, it's kind of hard to explain that's why these visuals are really nice and uh, and then they exit your house and uh, yeah so the exhaustion pipe goes then through some mass and then then it goes out of your house and uh, after about 30 feet of exhaust going through some thermal mass uh, the what comes out should be just a little bit warm but not hot to the touch and uh, you'll know when that happens that you've squeezed every little bit of BTU out of the fuel as possible and of course, there are you know very specific dimensions and very specific principles and some fire science that you should really know and a lot of specificity that I'm leaving out here. But I just want to give you the idea. I want to put the picture in your head, get your mind just thinking. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the specifics of what you need to do to make this work um, because you'll likely not remember it. And if you're going to build one, you really need to do a lot of your own research anyway. So uh, the recommendation that I hear a lot is uh, if you're going to build one, try, you know, build one according to the dimensions that someone else has already tested. So you're already known, you're already working with a known model or design that already works. Um, and then you build it outside first just to test it out and make sure that you've figured it out right. If you, you know, you don't want to make a mistake and have it make that mistake inside. So you build one outside first, make sure it's you know, working great and test it thoroughly. And then after you've, you know, you've had a success there, bring one inside. And, and that's kind of the safe way to do it.
Uh, there are books, DVDs, and plans available from a variety of places, but certainly, um, you know, Ernie and Erica.info is a really good resource if you are really serious about building your own rocket stove. They have their, they sell plans and designs, and they're coming out with their own ro uh, rocket mass heater book, and uh, they do workshops and have a DVD, so really great, great, great resource. So, if you had a rocket mass heater and you had a few solar panels and a solar charger or two and uh, who knows a dozen lead acid batteries and an inverter and you you know if you had all these then you really wouldn't uh, need uh, the public utility right you wouldn't need um, you wouldn't have a utility bill you would be pretty much completely off the grid right and yet you could still have the internet you know internet's very important to me I, I, I suspect it is with you you can get uh, internet with uh, by using a cell phone with Wi-Fi tethering, or by satellite. And I'm sure, uh, you know, cell phone wire, you know, wi wireless tethering will be cheaper and cheaper as uh, time goes on. And I've uh, I've even read about one person who, in a cold climate, heated he he heated yeah <laughs> he uh he heated his entire home with a rocket mass heater using only the junk mail and from free catalogs that he received in the mail. So these things are, are really super efficient. They can really squeeze out uh, all the energy um, in what you feed them. So yeah, without a utility bill each month, um, without uh, paying for electricity or natural gas or heating oil, what would you do with that reduction in your living expenses? How much uh, freer could you perhaps scale, you know, scale back? Would you scale back some hours at work and live your life a little bit more the way you want? Um, or maybe we would stay at work and invest those, uh, invest, invest that money towards a retirement or put towards some investment. On the other hand, if you really think about it, if you have reduced your living expenses so low, you know, say you're living, you can live live on less than ten thousand dollars a year. If you only need ten thousand dollars a year, you really don't need you know these massive retirement savings in order to retire. If you didn't have a mortgage or utilities or a big grocery bill. Um, because you know you're growing a lot of your own food you know maybe you could retire really early maybe you could retire at 40 50 um maybe 30 <laughs> you know that, that ship sailed for me i'm hoping for 45 or something <laughs> um you know maybe you could uh, finally get to writing that novel you've always wanted to write or maybe you could just spend more time with your kids and uh enjoy that time spent with them or uh maybe you could read those books you've been meaning to read hmm? or i know i got a lot of those or uh, you could develop that uh, agorist business you've been thinking about. And, you know, the options are really up to you, of course. Uh, but uh, I think the possibilities that uh, permaculture lays on the table in terms of strategies to help us meet our needs for autonomy, freedom, and liberty are opportunities that are waiting to be utilized. And uh, yeah, so I'll move on to the next subject. The next uh, topic I want to talk about is water. Water is a, a fundamental physical need, right along with uh, shelter, warmth, cooleth, food, and air, right? So there are a lot of ways to harvest water. Uh, you could harvest uh, rainwater off your roof, but uh, you know, you, but with an alien structure, you might be uh, really better off creating some uh, good drainage away from your house. And, and, uh, and then downhill from your house, you could then have a, a cistern that uh, collected rainwater for the use, for use downhill. Uh, or you could install a, a hand pump uh, in, in that downhill cistern and then pump water uh, from your downhill cistern back up into your house, um, or, and, and this seems to be the more preferable option to me, you could create uh, another kind of roof uphill from the house using plastic sheeting that you've buried a few inches below a cover of sand or gravel that could shunt uh, the uphill water to an uphill cistern that uh, was above your house, so that way you'd have gravity-fed rainwater to your house with no pumping needed. To me, this sounds like a perhaps a preferable, op preferable option. Maybe do both. Um, in addition to this, it's possible to create new sources of water by actually shaping the land to harvest and store rainwater in the soil itself. And eventually, if there's enough water in the soil, it will break uh, above the surface. It will come to the surface of the, of the soil. And uh, this can create new springs and new streams. And, you know, you can direct those water sources into holding ponds, um, which further, you know, helps create, you know, Water, these water plumes, and uh, maybe you grow some fish in uh, some ponds uh, above your house, and maybe you have a duck pond uh, below your house and provides you with duck eggs. But uh, in any case, using gravity and the hydrology of water in soil, you can uh, shape the land to act like a, a water sponge instead of a water slide. 
And uh, so instead of the water going off your property um, before, you know, too fast for you to capture it, you can actually shape the land by digging um, these swales or ditches, usually by hand, or uh, I'm sorry, by hand or usually by a track hoe. You can build these, these swales, or which were really just a kind of a ditch uh, on contour. Um, and by putting this ditch uh, along the contour lines, uh, as the water goes down the hill naturally, it uh, hits the swale and just slows down. It now has to fill the swale and then, uh, or go through the swale in order to, uh, to get past the swale. And of course, this slows that water down a, a whole bunch. You know, you might be able to slow the water down 30 times, which over time will increase the amount of water in your soil creating these water plumes um, that we really can't see, but are just represent uh, the saturation of uh, water, um, of the soil being saturated with water. And uh, as those water plumes fill, eventually the water uh, will come to the surface downhill to form little trickles. And these trickles can be combined to create streams, and these streams can feed ponds. And if you were to plant your trees uphill of these swales, these ditches on contour, and plant your vegetables downhill of, your, uh, of, the, of the swales, you really would never need to worry about irrigation. The trees could easily send their roots uh, down to the swale where they can get the water they need. And of course the water you need is, uh, the, you know, the plants you have on the downhill part of the swale can just reach down and grab the water that's going below them. And uh, so the way you have designed and shaped the land, you've created an automatic watering system. Now, uh, you have a cistern with water uh, that you can ensure its potability uh, with a water filter. And uh, it's just rainwater, so it's plenty clean enough for bathing or washing dishes. Or, or if you want, you could pay the added expense, maybe $10,000 or so, to uh, drill yourself, have a, have a uh, truly uh, true deep water well uh, drilled. And uh, now your water supply is not connected to a public utility. There's no... There's no inst uh, agent of an institution of domination fluoridating your water for, for you. Um, you are a little bit more autonomous, especially when it comes to water. And uh, as your gray water from taking baths or washing clothes or washing the dishes goes down the drain, it uh, washes into a ditch downstream into which you've planted a variety of plants that will clean, help you clean that water, um, help clean it of impurities. And uh, in less than 100 feet of, of gray water management ditch, most households can have uh, water that's actually safe to irrigate their vegetables with or even uh, water their livestock. And you, you know, suddenly you don't need a, a public uh, sewer to process your gray water. The management of night soil gets beyond what I want to get into here, but there are even ways to productively managing uh, human urine and feces such that there's really no need for a sewer. Uh, and suddenly now your, your, your need for the institution of domination's uh, services just uh, decreased. And it has made the question, who will build the roads, uh, just that little bit more less meaningful. Um, because you've become like a living demonstration and evidence and proof that the institution uh, of institutions of domination are unnecessary and for you generally only burdensome. And uh, a variety of permaculture techniques can be employed to supply a uh, reliable source of water and uh, effective management of wastewater. Uh, of, of wastewater. Um, you don't need, the, you know, the institution of domination's coercively socialized monopolies. Uh, you can autonomously, autonomously build your own system. And for more information on these, uh, you can uh, go to harvestingrainwater.com. And there's also Brad Lancaster's book, Harvesting Rainwater for Drylands and Beyond as well as Art Ludwig's book, uh, Creating an Oasis with Gray Water, Choosing, Building, and Using Gray Water Systems. And uh, also, in terms of the night soil, you can uh, take a look at The Human Manure Handbook, A Guide to Hump Composting Human Manure by Joseph C. Jenkins. So, after housing and possibly transportation, the greatest average household expenditures for a household is, uh, well, food. About 12% of total household expenditure on average. And uh, I gotta ask, you know, do you feel comfortable with the food you're eating? Uh, would you like to eat food that is even better than organic uh, for less than the cost of conventional food at the grocery store? Uh, do you trust the FDA to make sure your food is safe? Uh, perhaps your needs for safe foods could be met by growing your own food or buying uh, uh, food from people you know and trust that are you know that are growing it in a, in a, in a safe way uh, perhaps you eat meat but you'd like to know that the animals that have become your nutritional protein have been treated ethically and with full respect perhaps you'd like to know that uh, uh, your the chickens that you're consuming got to live like chickens and maybe that your pigs had the opportunity to live as pigs for a while 
Perhaps uh, you could use livestock like ducks to control the slugs in your garden, thus turning the slugs, which are uh, uh, something you don't want so much, uh, to protein or to duck eggs, um, converting uh, a, you know, a waste into a, a resource. Uh, perhaps uh, you could allow your pigs to do much of the work of plowing for you. Um, you know, you don't need a tractor or a plow if you have pigs. The plow, the, the pigs will, uh, will prepare the soil just fine for you. Perhaps you'd like to take advantage of uh, converting your ch kitchen scraps and convert them very quickly to uh, protein and fertilizer by feeding them to uh, rabbits and chickens. You know, there's just some interesting interac interactions. There's possibilities there. I guess what I'm trying to suggest uh, and what I'm getting at is that a food food production, if designed in, designed intelligently, it doesn't have to be intensive uh, in labor. You know, it doesn't have to. You don't have to be working like a you know like you're a, a servant of your farm just to produce this uh, this food for you. You if you interact cooperatively with your livestock, if you share with the wildlife and don't look at them as as enemies. Um, if you tend to the plants, um, the plants tend you. If you work cooperatively uh, with the land, the land can work cooperatively with you, and there can be uh, some beneficial, mutually beneficial interactions going on there. And for me, this is like really the essence of what many call anarchism, that uh, the essence of that, that mutually beneficial interactions and relationships uh, create more needs meeting potential than diminutive or controlling manipulative relationships. This is the, the fundamental insight of the Austrian school theory of subjective value, that uh, power over others um, is not as needs meeting as power with others, that uh, cooperation is greater than domination. And maybe you're not ordinarily concerned with uh, the environment, or maybe you're not ordinarily concerned with the, uh, the quality of your food or the lives of your chickens that you consume, but I'd like to suggest that perhaps by giving a, the, a chicken the freedom to express its chickenness, um, it could be of greater benefit to ourselves than trying to dominate and suppress the chicken's chickenness. Um, maybe the chicken will be healthier and even nutritionally will meet our needs more if that's the case. And perhaps that's either here nor there, but uh, I was willing to offer you that thought, uh, for at least for your consideration, as a possible extension of freedom, liberty, and autonomy. So on to food production systems. I'd like to focus your attention on the possibility of food forests. Food forests are a, uh, a design that emulate natural forests, but uh, design the forest so that the natural ecological progression of the, the land's maximal climate state is uh, one which has the trees that benefit you. Um, the trees either uh, provide you with a yield or for the people who are doing the designing, or the trees support the plants that are providing the yield. Um, every kind of tree, from apples to pears to cherries, persimmons, plums uh, to chestnuts, walnuts, filberts to geez, uh, honey locusts, grapes, kiwis, and hops can all be in a food forest. Uh, the understories can consist of you know, comfrey and blueberries and mayhaws and currants and raspberries and rhubarb and horseradish and Jerusalem artichokes and groundnut. These could all produce yields you know, perennial, per perennially, without the need to buy more seed. Uh, additionally, with careful planning, you could uh, maybe plant four to six times more than the expected needs of your family, allowing that maybe half is lost to, you know, wildlife or, you know, storms or frosts or something like that. And then if you eat just the half, half of the half that remains, um, you still have a potentially extra for sale while allowing the remaining half to go to seed completely mature and reseed it to reseed themselves allowing you to save money on the cost of seeds as well as saving you the labor if, if time and your labor is valuable to you of uh, replanting so with intelligent design you could have 25 or 30 different paddocks fenced in areas and your livestock could actually prepare each paddock for you uh, you know, cleaning it down of uh, a, lot, a lot of the plants that you don't want. You can still protect your important trees and perennials, uh, maybe with a little wire mesh, but uh, all the stuff that are kind of, all the wildness that's going on um, in those paddocks can uh, can be consumed by your, your animals and converted into protein. And then you can take your seeds from last year that you took from your plants and reseed the paddock. And uh, yeah, it might take, you know, uh, I, you know, by the time you move through 30 paddocks, if you move them every two weeks or, uh, 
you know, it would probably take almost a year. If you moved them once a week, it would take uh, six months before the animals got back to the original paddock that they started from. And so the land has this guaranteed chance to heal, and it benefits from the manure, and it benefits from the disturbance of the animals. Uh, <clears throat> And as well as uh, converting uh, potentially, you know, fallow areas into beneficially uh, protein-producing areas, and using like wagon wheel patterns or other patterns, you might only have to build, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one or two animal shelters for every eight paddocks. So, and of course, using Euler structure principles, we could easily construct a shelter out of natural materials, um, some polyethylene sh plastic sheeting, and we can create some very inexpensive animal shelters that will cost only a uh, hundred dollars or two hundred dollars per structure, and yet have all the co great effects of being a little bit cooler in the summer, a little bit warmer in the winter. Uh, plus, you already have swales, right? So you already have this automatic watering system for your animals wherever they might be, and. Uh, Perhaps by adding a livestock dog or a donkey or a llama, you might not even have to concern yourself with predators like coyotes and things. So, and plus, uh, livestock along the outer boundaries of your property might even act as a early warning security system. You know, ducks, geese, and other livestock will sometimes admit uh, pattern noise noticeably different from their usual when they perceive that they're being threatened. So, uh, the livestock are automatically fed for you because they're grazing on the pasture. They're automatically watered because they've got uh, the uh, the swales, the ditches on contour. Uh, they have shelter from the storms that you can build pretty inexpensively uh, using the uh, the Euler structured uh, principles. And uh, they have food forests for shade and the heat, and all you really have to do is move them around every week or two. They get to live happy lives outside, expressing their chickenness or their goatness or their pigness, and uh, they're all under your protection. And then in return, they'll eventually provide you perhaps with some kind of uh, food or, or milk or uh, uh, wool. Uh, and they're providing you also with fertilizer, and they're helping move you that your seeds around. They're helping you uh, plant your things. <laughs> so to recap, uh, by planting a, a perennial uh, vegetables and yield-bearing trees, we can end up in a situation where, after five years, we just have such an abundance of fruit or nuts that we're probably super busy uh, dehydrating, fermenting, and canning the yield, and probably have just uh, you know just a lot of surplus to be sold to others. And this is where you know can be a, a source of revenue. And having a significant source of calories provided by these perennial vegetables and trees, we reduce our labor inputs in planting and tending and have a more stable source of food. We might, uh, of course, and the other thing nice too is that uh, if someone wants to steal your food, they might see your vegetable garden and say, oh, that's food, I can take that. But they're not going to see your food forest and be like, you know, oh, I can, they're not going to see that as food. So uh, the chance of someone stealing you know, food from your food forest, it's kind of like hidden food. It's, it's kind of a neat feature. So, uh, yeah, if we reduce our grocery bill by, say, 90%, uh, our only real food expenditures being coffee, chocolate, bananas, and other tropical specialties, coconut oil, these kind of things, um, you know, we can uh, live a little freer that way. That's, you know, 12% of our, our house, annual household expenditures that we don't need to make. Maybe we can knock that down to just 1% or 2%. Uh, building a root cellar in or near or around our... <coughs> pardon me again. Building in around our alien structure might also uh, be a way of preserving a yield through the winter. And uh, yeah, if you. Sorry, I'm coughing a lot because I'm talking for a long time. Hmm. Um, so if you didn't have to worry about uh, what you will eat next week and how much freer would that make you feel, right? Uh, if you knew you had developed systems by which there was always an abundance of fresh organic food, how much less would you have to depend on the food that's delivered to the market by the agricultural subsidies provided by the institution of domination? Hmm? Uh, how much more comfortable would you feel knowing uh, where your food came from and how your food was treated and handled? So, yeah, I'm, I'm putting these things together in my head and I'm thinking, geez, if my needs for shelter are met, my energy are met, water and food, um, if they're all met on the land where I lived on, I would feel a lot freer. Even if there, I, there was, I lived in this territory uh, dominated by this institution of domination, right? Um, you know, I could powerfully meet some autonomy needs in this situation. Uh, and I'm just kind of asking you, you know, how powerful would it be for you to take on... Uh, take in a picture of how, how you might live, you know, it, you'd be like a proof or a, an evidence yourself personally that the institution of domination is unnecessary, that people can live in an ecologically regenerative way, and here the state is, you know, making the environment worse. Um, you know, and maybe everyone's life would be better um, if the institution of domination would only give us some space and leave us alone. 
You know, what would you be willing to do in order to meet your need for freedom, liberty, and autonomy? Hmm? How far uh, are you willing to go? So, all right, I guess uh, we'll go move on to how to make money. Yeah, because we're going to need some money, right? We're going to want to buy books and DVDs, and we're going to want maybe the occasional cell phone or cell phone contract, and Netflix is pretty cool, and there's also those extortion fees, those uh, feudal land rents that we'll have to pay, right? Um property taxes, and uh, also miscellaneous expenses that turn up from time to time, so we'll need some money. And I'm just going to make a few suggestions on just to get your mind cranking on uh, how you could make a little bit of extra cash and, uh, you know, have all the cash you'd want um, without having to work a job Monday through Friday, getting up in the morning, spend more time with family, that kind of thing. You know, you could, uh, well, uh, maybe you could uh, sell organic produce. You know, maybe you really like producing vegetables, and well, organic produce sells for a lot higher, so you could make a, uh, a little bit more money selling organic produce. And uh, maybe you could sell organic herbs, because herbs already are pretty expensive, especially if you think about the, the price per pound. It might be $14, $20 a pound. And you're growing it. You can grow, you know, 10 pounds, you know. Uh, cut uh, a pound a week and sell it for $20 a pound to the local uh, restaurant, right? For their, Maybe you can grow greens for their, their uh, salad bar, organic greens, selling, selling for $18 a pound. Um, maybe you're selling organic mushrooms. Um, you know, if you've got trees, you've got logs, you put the, the mushroom spawn in the, in the, in the trees in a, in a spot that's kind of humid and dark and in the shade, and uh, geez, you'll have mushrooms. And these things go for $10, $20 a pound. And you could be selling dehydrated produce or dehydrated fruit that you dried in a solar-powered dehydrator. Um, you could sell seeds, seeds that are especially adapted to your climate, and you could sell it to other people who are in your climate. You could be selling saplings from your food forest. You could be selling livestock. You could be selling cheeses from the goat milk, organic cheese from organic grass-fed goats. How much does that sell for per pound? Um, you could sell organic uh, free-range eggs, right, or paddock uh, shifted eggs. And you could sell these at a roadside stand. You could be selling homemade soap on the internet. You could you could uh, be blacksmithing and working iron and copper and bronze artifacts using a rocket mass heater forge. Um, you could maybe you're into crafts, basket weaving, jewelry. I don't know any number of artistic crafts. You could you could teach workshops how to build a structure. Here's your here's your portfolio. Here's your resume. It's the Ailer structure you built that you live in. You know, maybe you teach uh, how to build rocket mass heaters. You could probably give a, a workshop. Uh, you know, a month once a month, maybe uh, once every other month, uh, and get five or six students coming in there and learn about a rocket mass heater. Especially if you're somewhere nearby where you know the local uh, population would uh, be into that kind of thing. Um, let's say like a local college or something. Um, you could teach how to develop food forests. You could, you know, uh, teach uh, ecologically regenerative landscaping, or maybe you start up an agorist winery or meadery, or a brewery or a distillery or something. I don't know. It's possibilities. You could be providing services, such as woodcutting services, and that would provide you with all the free wood you wanted for your own rocket mass heater, and you could sell firewood to others or sell uh, fuel for, to your friends and the, the rest of the microvillage. Maybe you could provide some agorist haircutting or uh, veterinary services or um, various permaculture installations, you know, contract or permaculture consultations, or uh, you could telecommute online, of course, you know. Um, maybe since you don't really need that much money, you do a lot of mutual aid and just provide community services, this kind of thing. Well, whatever agorist or uh, conventional business you'd like to create, it probably should reflect your uh, individuality, your creativity. It should uh, reflect what you love to do rather than uh, what you would love to do, you know, what you're doing for money. Um, you know, make your make your life your, your passion, right? Make it so that every act is play. Make it so that everything you do is a gift to yourself and others. Uh, so, you know, building your agorist business, you might be able to, uh, you might be free to live your life in a way you'd like to live it. Maybe you could even sell baklava on the internet like uh, other people we know, right? So, how free would you feel, you know, if you were your own boss? Think about that, you know? Uh, and if you had the security that you didn't, you could take some risks, you didn't uh, need a steady income. Um, if you can decide what jobs you wanted and what to take and what jobs you decide to pass up because that customer isn't worth dealing with uh, because you actually only need the money to buy, you know, uh, luxury items and pay your extortion uh, <laughs> fees or whatever the other nominal expenses uh, for entertainment and enjoyment that might pop up. 
You know, how free would you feel then if you had very little expenses and uh, very many options for how you might uh, get the cash to live your life, how you'd like to live it? Just some thoughts. Okay, final topic. And uh, let's talk about potential communities. Wrap this thing up. You know, certainly there's been a rural bias to my perspective and where I come from, but uh, there's certainly nothing stopping uh, something like the Free Detroit from uh, adopting some of these techniques to increase their freedom. Maybe they begin catching rainwater off a roof. Uh, maybe they buy an abandoned industrial or commercial building. They turn the whole thing into an intentional community with one family per room. Or maybe they buy up a, a series of houses and uh, uh, a whole street or a whole block and uh, use that as like kind of an intentional community. Maybe they begin growing uh, food on roofs um, or they grow kiwis on the side of the walls or hops or grapes, you know, these vines. Um, you know, while my mind looks to freedom, liberty, and autonomy in rural area, there's really nothing that... Uh, impedes these techniques from being used in an urban area other than those institu institutions of domination being a little bit too close for, for comfort for me. But imagine uh, combining all these techniques together and fully integrating yourself in some kind of permaculture style design, right? A, a, a design approach. You having no rent, no mortgage, no electricity bill, no natural gas, uh, no heating bill, very little of a grocery bill. You really only need now uh, just a uh, You really only need uh, like a modicum of income now in order to live comfortably. And so imagine living in a, uh, a little micro village of four to maybe up to a dozen or more households. All people, you know, peop your friends all living together in the same piece of land, all living in alo structures, all with rocket mass heaters or wood stoves or, you know, maybe people are also building other kinds of structures. And maybe everyone has a little, a little bit of a food forest or, and those who want it can have their livestock. Imagine your life, um, how, what life you would lead if you could own your own business. And, uh, and perhaps imagine if there's a community, a community building in the center of this micro village uh, where people can gather to connect. Maybe in the early morning there's coffee and tea and maybe um, there's even uh, some shared meals and uh, you know probably most houses here are going to have solar panels and battery banks and uh, cell phones with unlimited data and Wi-Fi tethering. And uh, maybe imagine uh, maybe the, even the teenagers they they run a little business in the community house they uh, they make breakfast and coffee you know they make coffee and breakfast early in the morning and they run sort of a coffee shop with uh, serving uh, breakfast and lunch and they do this for some uh, mediums of exchange right you know how free do you imagine yourself in this picture you know would this be something that meets your needs for liberty for choice for autonomy hmm? you know. This is the idea of what's called intentional community. It's the idea of creating a little slice of pork fest or a little slice of the Midwest Liberty Fest um, in your life indefinitely. You know, you know, if this sounds like something you would like, you know, I'd like to invite you to begin exploring these uh, possible strategies for meeting autonomy needs um, in permaculture as, as well as intentional communities and and especially a nonviolent communication. You know, if you're going to live with your friends and uh, in an int intentional community, you're going to want to be able to communicate with them in a, in a in a peaceful, empathic way. You're going to want to make connections. Um, my from what I read and uh, what I understand, actually, in intentional communities, there's actually probably more conflict in in an intentional community than there is in the general. Uh, community, but uh, that often the experience for most people is that these uh, conflicts are resolved much more satisfactorily because there is these relationships, these are these there are these connections, there is that trust that's there. And, uh, you know, maybe you could even meet uh, your needs for both community and autonomy uh, in using uh, the combination integration of all these strategies. And uh, now I'd just like to, to thank you for the giving me the beautiful gift, which is your presence in uh, watching this video for and for accepting the contribution that I wish to share. And I hope that in the future we might all find strategies to uh, meet our needs for community and autonomy. And perhaps uh, some of those needs will be met in a multitude of micro village communities in the future. And I'd certainly be open to receiving your questions and comments on anything here. And my hope was uh, just that this would be a, a value to you. Uh, thank you so much and uh, be well.